Hello and welcome to episode 37, Remastered. This episode will be the first in an entirely new series about ecology. And this will be really exciting because I love ecology. Ecology is endlessly fascinating. And I hope that as we go through this episode and this whole series, you'll see what I mean and eventually share my enthusiasm for how interesting and complex and all-encompassing that ecology really is. Most fundamentally, the study of ecology is the study of how organisms interact with other organisms, and how they interact with the physical terrain upon which they live. Ecology is basically the study of these interactions, all kinds of interactions, between an endless variety of organisms and those between an organism and its abiotic environment. For example, one of the most famous ecological relationships is uh, flowers and their pollinators. Flowers and bees interact in a mutually beneficial way. The bee can get sugary nectar, and the flower uses the bee as a vector to transport pollen from flower to flower. Many funguses interact with plants by growing into the cells in their roots, and these fungi either symbiotically share or parasitically take nutrients from their host plants. The roots of trees hold the soil together against the rain and the wind, and this makes the soil stable enough for other organisms like smaller plants, fungi, and especially burrowing animals to live there. The animals engage in a huge variety of interactions, like the birds that eat food from between an alligator's teeth, or the small fish that hang around larger fish and feed off of their scraps, or the maggots and the vultures that scavenge dead tissue. All of these interactions are ecological relationships. The relationship between predator and prey is ecological. So is the relationship between parasite and host. The relationship between symbiotes and mutualist. Between habitat and inhabitant. Between individuals and a population group. Between parents and offspring. You name it. Ecology is one of those things that's ever-present. It's really all-encompassing. If you have two or more anythings, and they interact in any way, there's an ecological relationship there. These are like sandboxes for natural selection and evolution to play in, because everything from the literal body structure to the behavior of any given organism defines the ecological role that that organism has. Groups of organisms, or populations, have their own collective behaviors, like grazing, stampeding, pack hunting, or whatever else. And then you have to consider groups of groups, or multi-species communities, wherein a number of plants and animals and everything else all coexist together in a physical habitat. And then you have a number of these communities, which are spread across a large chunk of geographic space, and this makes an ecosystem. And the sum total of all of these ecosystems is the biosphere, which is the thin layer of thriving life that covers the surface of the planet. It's these increasingly large and increasingly complex levels of organization through which ecologists study the living world. There are five levels to this study of ecology. These five levels are organismal ecology, or individual ecology, uh, it's the ecology of the behavior of an individual organism. And then you have population ecology, which is the ecology of groups of individuals. Typically, when scientists refer to a population, they're referring to a group of individuals of the same species. And a population typically comprises its own little gene pool. All these individuals are mating amongst each other. And then you have community ecology, which is groups of different species in a single habitat all interacting together. So this will be your fungus, this will be your plants, and all of your different animals uh, pollinating and helping feed each other nutrients and everything. Beyond this, you'll have ecosystem ecology, which is basically the study of multiple communities spread across a large geographic region. And then, finally, we come to the, the grand totality of it all. We come to the ecology of the global biosphere, also known as the biome of the planet Earth. Now, to go back over these in a, in a little more detail, individual ecology, or organismal ecology, focuses on the individual organism, 
This level of study involves looking at the behavior and the morphology and the physiology that the individual organism uses to live in its habitat and thrive and reproduce. It looks at why certain individuals will succeed during a high stress or a high competition event and why others might fail. Individual ecology also studies the fitness of individual organisms and the nuances of their personal interactions with their environment. When you study one organism, you tend to see that it interacts in some way with other members of its species. This naturally takes us to population ecology, which is the next level. When ecologists study population ecology, they're typically looking at things like a herd of caribou, or a flock of birds, or a pack of wolves, or anything else like that. Populations of organisms can have dramatic effects on the environment, like herds of grazing herbivores that can decimate the vegetation in a region, or you have swarming insects, and these too can consume huge quantities of vegetation, and they can clean out entire habitats if their populations are too large. When you start to look at the interactions of populations from different species, you start looking at biological communities. Community ecology involves looking at stuff like the effects of a predator population that hunts and kills members of a prey population. Naturally, there are cycles inherent in many systems, and in the relationship between predator and prey, there are many such cycles. The population of the prey animal rises, and shortly afterwards, the population of predators rises too, because they have more available food, and so the predators can eat more prey and support a larger population. But eventually, as the prey population grows, it'll overshoot the carrying capacity of its environment, and they begin to be unable to find enough food to survive, and so you have individuals who start to starve. The population of the prey will start to dwindle, and following shortly afterward will be the predator population, because it too can't sustain its numbers when its prey population shrinks. The predator population has found that it too has overshot its uh, available prey, and starvation will cull them down to size. When the predator population begins to shrink, the prey population suffers fewer and fewer deaths at the claws and the fangs of the predators, and the prey population begins to increase again. The cycle begins to make another revolution. The prey population rises, and the predator population will follow right on cycle, except on a slight delay behind the prey population. And when you look at this cyclical relationship between predator and prey, you're taking on an ecological understanding of a community relationship. If it helps you understand the premise here, think of it like enzymes that downregulate or upregulate the activity of other enzymes. You have very similar cycles that exist in the biochemistry of our cells that keep us alive, and in a way, you could call that biochemical ecology. Now that we're looking at how organisms interact at the level of the community, we can start to look at how these populations and these communities engage with the physical, non-living environment around them. These living and non-living components, or biotic and abiotic components, together make up an ecosystem. And ecosystem ecology looks at how the living things in an environment use and interact with all of the non-living things. For example, you have a river, which is an abiotic item. The river itself isn't alive. It's just a ribbon of flowing water, weaving and eroding its way down a landscape through the path of least resistance. But this flowing water presents opportunity and danger for life. Fish can swim in it and make the river their home, as do many arthropods and amphibians. Animals can feed out of a river, like a bear which claws at salmon swimming upstream to reproduce. A larger river, or a cleaner river, might be able to support a larger population of salmon, which in turn can support more bears. These are all ecological relationships that, while they might seem discrete, they all flow together in a seamless but complex symphony. This symphony of ecosystem harmony moves nutrients and energy through physical space, and ecosystem ecology seeks to understand how and why those nutrients and energy are cycled in the ways that they are. To fully understand this, we have to step back to appreciate the largest level in the study of ecology, that of global ecology, 
of the biosphere. The planet Earth receives a finite amount of light energy from the sun, and this light energy propagates the planet's climate. The tilt of the Earth as it spins on its axis and as it rotates around the sun determines the cyclical nature of the seasons. Phototrophic organisms, like plants, absorb this light energy directly and turn it into chemical energy. This chemical energy is passed on to herbivores as they eat the plants, and then the energy is passed into carnivores as they eat the herbivores. All of the plants and herbivores and carnivores are interacting on the planet's crust, roaming and digging and swimming and flying across the seas and mountains and valleys and rivers and all sorts of natural features that define the surface of the planet Earth. Understanding the sum total of all of these abiotic and biotic factors and all of their interactions on a global scale is the purpose of global ecology. Besides humans, which have the intelligence to adapt to virtually any environment, there aren't any organisms that can survive or thrive in every habitat on Earth. Species have biological limitations, or biotic factors, that hamper their expansion into certain regions, because these geographic regions have abiotic factors that make them inhospitable to that given species. For example, a polar bear has evolved to thrive on the Arctic ice sheets, but the polar bear will quickly overheat and die in a sandy desert like the Sahara. An amphibian, like a salamander, can do quite well for itself in a steamy jungle where its permeable skin and low tolerance for cold temperatures aren't that problematic, and it can easily find a body of water to wet its skin and to lay its eggs. But if that salamander were to also be in the Sahara Desert, it would die of dehydration in a matter of hours. And if it were in the Arctic with the polar bears, it would freeze to death in minutes. Consider fish, which can thrive in the ocean, but they don't do very well on the snowy peaks of a mountain ridge. Mountain goats do great on mountains, but they would die pretty quickly in the oceans, as they can't swim very well or hold their breath for very long and they don't really have any adaptations to hunting and finding food in the middle of the ocean. You might notice how animals and plants seem to be quite well adapted to their habitats. They've had millions of years of natural selection to sculpt their lineages to fit perfectly into the environments that they live in. All organisms experience fitness trade-offs as they evolve to fit certain niches or uh, to live in certain habitats and to perform some kind of ecological role within that habitat. That's called a niche, and I'll be referring to that a lot in this series. When the first lobe-finned fish began to migrate onto dry land, they began an evolutionary process wherein one trait was replaced by another in response to the abiotic factors that they were experiencing. The ancestors of the lobed-finned fish had fins for swimming in the water and for scurrying around the muddy floor of a, of a lake bed or of the ocean. But as this lineage became more adapted to the muddy habitats, to the semi-terrestrial habitats, to a landscape, essentially, they worked themselves closer and closer to the shore, until eventually the population found that it was feeding by skipping between puddles in the mud along the shore, being exposed to, and eventually breathing, the open air. As they moved further and further onto dry land, and spent relatively less time in the water, their fins would splay out into feet, and their lobed limbs would extend into legs that grew to their sides or underneath their bodies to hold them up against the force of gravity, because now that they were out of the water, they couldn't rely on water's buoyancy to hold their bodies up anymore. This is what happens when an aquatic lineage is exposed to the pressures of dry land as opposed to the, the pressures of aquatic life. But this can work in reverse as well. Consider whales and dolphins, which are mammals whose ancestors were once land-dwelling organisms with legs. But these land-dwelling ancestor mammals eventually returned to the sea, and their descendants' legs evolved into flippers, which are clearly better for swimming than legs designed for walking on dry land. 
In this case, the water in the marine habitat and the dry land in the terrestrial habitat are abiotic factors that can influence the local ecology and the evolution of the resident species. Some other good examples of uh, terrestrial mammal lineages going back into an aquatic habitat include uh, seals and walruses. Another abiotic factor is the shape of the landscape itself, including mountains, rivers, valleys, archipelagos, and uh, land bridges, also called isthmuses. But isthmus is an awful word to say, so we'll go with land bridges. The mountains act as a barrier to species movement, which can confine their habitats and their geographic ranges behind an impassable wall of rock. Mountains are also barriers to wind and clouds, which can have downstream effects on the nearby habitats. For example, if a mountain range prevents clouds from passing over them, then those clouds will break apart on the, the rainy side of the mountains. They'll rain down the wet side of the mountains, and they'll feed a, a verdant, heavily vegetated ecology on that side. But the other side of the mountains will rarely, if ever, get rain. It would be dry and much less fertile for life, and any ecosystems that exist here will be much simpler, with a much lower species diversity. When this kind of thing happens, when the mountains interfere with the rainfall and the cloud movement, it's called a rain shadow, because the drier region is basically existing in the shadow of rainfall, which is always just over the mountains, but never overhead. A really good example of this is the Himalayas. Warm, humid wind comes in from the southeast, and it comes over India. But these rain clouds crash against the Himalayas, and so all of their rainfall goes to feed the jungles and the, the mountain valleys and the massive, fertile rivers of northern India. It's so fertile that this river valley in northern India is one of the most heavily and densely populated areas on the planet. But just beyond the Himalayas, deprived of all of this rain, you have Tibet, and western China, and Mongolia, and all of these Central Asian countries that live on this steppe region, which is much colder and much drier. Rivers also act like barriers to some species, but for other species they act as a source of food, or for other species, like fish, instead of being a barrier to movement, they are a literal transport corridor. The rivers, the lakes, and the oceans themselves are also massive heat sinks, and that's really important. Because water has a pretty high heat capacity, water can absorb and hold a lot of heat, which makes areas near these bodies of water much more temperate and less prone to temperature fluctuations or temperature extremes. This is why coastal areas and tropical areas with a very high humidity often have more stable climates, and relatively little to no seasonal temperature changes. While areas deeper inland are vulnerable to extremely hot summers and extremely cold winters. Archipelagos, or strings of islands, are also really interesting because they often contain similar, related species with minor divergences between individuals or between species on different islands. This is famously the case in the Galapagos Islands, where finches were able to fly between the islands to establish local populations, and each little local island-bound population subsequently adapted to their specific island environment. The land bridges, or the isthmuses, are like the opposite of the archipelago, because the land bridges provide a travel corridor for terrestrial species to move between two larger regions of land. For example, the land bridge that connects North and South America is called the Panama Isthmus, and when the Panama Isthmus first formed and first connected North and South America, it enabled thousands of species of insects, mammal, reptile, and amphibian to cross from one continent to the other. This actually led to a huge diversification event called the Great American Interchange, where species that migrated from one continent to the other adapted to fit into their new habitats, but some had more success than others. 
For example, the North American species moving into South America had a much easier time, because the South American savanna and rainforests were much more hospitable, whereas the, the South American animals moving north were moving into desert. I think these land bridges are really interesting from an ecological perspective, because they do two opposite things at the same time. I already mentioned the obvious utility that they provide. Land bridges provide travel corridors for animals, uh, terrestrial animals, to migrate through. But I haven't mentioned the opposite thing they do. A land bridge, like the Panama Isthmus, bisect marine communities. They cut marine communities in half. When the Panama Isthmus formed, dry land rose out of the sea, which created a barrier between the Pacific Ocean to the west and the Atlantic Ocean to the east. The communities of flora and fauna that swam in the ocean or that crawled along the seafloor were literally split apart by the land bridge, which forced an evolutionary divergence in these separated populations. And we see this divergence dated to the emergence of the land bridge not only in their physiology, but in their genes. Life in the oceans are subject to just as many abiotic variables as life on land, if not more. Life in the oceans has to deal with the temperature of the water, which strictly limits where some organisms can and cannot live. They have to deal with the salt level of the water, or the salinity, which divides marine life into that which lives in freshwater or saltwater habitats. The ambient salt level in a habitat can have a huge effect on an organism, down to the level of their cells, because the salinity of the water plays a huge role in biochemistry, and the salinity of the environment, if it's not right, it can mess with the osmosis and the internal water regulation of the cell, and that can harm the organism as a whole. The pH of the water, or its acidity, is another factor that life must adapt to and tolerate as some regions are much more acidic or more basic than others. Because of our industrial activity, we're producing a lot of carbon dioxide, and a lot of this carbon dioxide gets dissolved in seawater. The problem with this is that it ends up lowering the overall pH of the ocean. The CO2 literally makes the ocean water more acidic, and when that happens, bad stuff happens. All sorts of marine species, from corals to arthropods, find that they can't produce shells in the low pH water, because the acidity is messing with the calcium carbonate, and it prevents them from integrating it into their bodies and using it to make their shells. Perhaps the biggest abiotic influence on marine life is the presence of nutrients. It's actually really challenging to accumulate nutrients in the open ocean especially water-soluble nutrients like phosphorus. In a water body that has strong currents or rapid flow rates, these water-soluble nutrients can get washed out. They can also wash these nutrients out of the soil, and this can harm plants, and thus it can harm terrestrial ecosystems or terrestrial ecologies. These nutrients, being water-soluble, run the risk of never really having a chance to accumulate, and local organisms never really get a chance to consume them reliably. On the other hand, in stillwater habitats, like deep in a marsh or in a lake, all of these nutrients will precipitate, and they'll settle onto the bottom of the water body. You know, onto the lake bed, or the ocean floor, where all of the critters crawling around on the floor get to eat it, but the stuff that's swimming around in the water itself really doesn't. Obviously, life can exist in the ocean. But how can life exist in the ocean if these nutrients are so hard to come by? The answer is that there are other ecological phenomena that stir up the nutrients and redisperse them across the water. In the ocean, a combination of wind and the Earth's rotation can create what are called upwellings, where wind and Coriolis forces push upper layers of water in a particular direction allowing for deeper water to come up to the surface. This creates vertical currents that can suck nutrients up from the seafloor and into the open ocean. This only happens in the oceans, as the oceans are the only bodies of water that are large enough for these geophysical mechanics to work. Lakes are much too small, 
But lakes do have their own means of cycling nutrients, called lake turnover. A lake is like a small pocket of water, which can get warmed relatively easily by sunlight. During the winter, a layer of ice forms on the surface of the lake, but below this ice, the water remains liquid. This physical property of water freezing during the winter allows the marine ecosystem to persist across the seasons. During the spring, this ice layer on top of the lake will melt, and cold water will saturate the upper layers of the lake. This cold water is dense, and it'll sink to the bottom of the lake while pushing up the warmer water from below. This sinking and rising of water currents creates a similar sweeping or flushing action, which takes nutrients from the lake bed and throws them back up into the surrounding lake water. This turnover is the cause for a burst in growth of plants and animals during the spring, as well as again in a separate event during the fall. Cooling air temperatures cause cooling water temperatures, and this cold surface water sinks to the bottom and will push up warmer water, rich with nutrient sediment that's accumulated on the lake bed. This will happen over and over again, and these seasonal cycles are hugely important for establishing the biological rhythms that this lake ecology lives by. And all of these biological rhythms and seasonal cycles and geochemical patterns, these all affect the global ecology. Everything feeds up into this greater global ecology. On that note, the climate is another seasonal abiotic factor of huge importance, which affects pretty much every organism, all life on the planet. Various climate and meteorological phenomena are responsible for creating the harsh bleakness of the high Arctic, the punishing barrenness and heat of the open desert, and the lush density of vegetation in a tropical rainforest. Rainfall is obviously important too, because rainfall directly feeds water into a region, and that's required for plants and animals to live. There's significantly more precipitation near the equator than anywhere else, which is why equatorial regions can support such dense biodiversity. If you look at a map of the Earth, or a globe, and you trace your finger along the equator, you'll see that it runs through the Amazon rainforest in South America the Congo in Africa, and all of the island rainforests of Southeast Asia and Oceania. This pattern of rainfall is part of a climate cycle wherein all of this moist air at the equator is warmed by the sun. This causes the warm air to rise higher into the atmosphere, where it will cool and condense. When the water cools, the water vapor will condense into clouds, and eventually it'll condense further into water droplets. When enough of these water droplets form, the cloud breaks apart and makes rain. As this cooler air rises, it moves towards the poles, dropping the bulk of its water as rain over the tropics. This even colder but now drier air will continue to move until it condenses further and settles back down to the Earth's surface, where it will then absorb moisture that it lost. The absorption of moisture makes these regions very dry which is why the areas around 30 degrees latitude north and south of the equator, uh, you know, right next to all of these tropical rainforests, all of these regions are characterized by drier climates and more desert-like biomes. To fully appreciate all of the abiotic factors that have an ecological role in life on Earth, we have to look at the rotation of the planet itself. Earth rotates on a tilted axis. This is to say that the axis of the rotation of the planet isn't exactly perpendicular to the plane of our orbit around the sun. Because of this tilted axis, the northern and southern hemispheres receive different amounts of light energy at different times of the year. In the months in the middle of the year, like June and July, the northern hemisphere is tilted toward the sun. The days are long and warm, saturated with light and heat. And if you're far enough north, like Alaska, or northern Canada, or Norway, or Sweden, or Finland, or northern Russia, in all of these places, in the, in the summer months, sometimes the sun doesn't even set. The sun can go multiple days without even moving below the horizon. It's no surprise, then, that plants grow best during the summer, 
when there's ample light and a favorable climate. But at the same time, in the middle of the year, in the southern hemisphere, it's winter, because the southern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. The situation is reversed near the beginning and the end of the year, when it's winter in the northern hemisphere and summer in the southern hemisphere. And to contrast this from the summer, all of those northern countries that I listed, uh, during the winter months, sometimes they'll go days where the sun doesn't rise above the horizon at all. Or if the sun does rise above the horizon, it only briefly dips above the horizon for a few hours before coming back down. The simple fact that the Earth rotates on a tilted axis is responsible for our seasons and the associated shifts in weather. All life on Earth must find a way to adapt to these seasonal changes. Some species don't have to do much at all, like a palm tree that's living in the equatorial tropics. There's no appreciable difference between summer and winter, and so the palm tree doesn't have to adapt to these intense seasonal differences. But other species might have to do quite a lot, like a birch tree that's living in the Canadian frontier, which will have to lose its leaves every autumn and bunker down every winter, only to bloom again every summer. In this way, the abiotic influence of the seasons has dominated the reproductive and growth schedules of the planet's life. Because there's all of these abiotic factors, there also has to be some biotic factors. These biotic factors are things that limit the range of a species, things that are caused by other living organisms. For example, if a particular plant is the host to a parasitic fungus, and that fungus uses no other species of plant as a host, then the range of that fungus will necessarily mirror that of the host plant. They'll overlap almost perfectly. This is simply because the parasitic fungus can't live anywhere else, on any other organism. It's limited to the same range its host is limited to. Similarly, if an animal is dependent on a specific food source, like a plant or some other particular species of prey, then that animal's range is going to be tightly limited to the range of the food item that they're dependent on. The animal that's doing the eating simply can't live away from the organism that it eats, which links the two species geographically. There's also cases when a parasite is so deadly that it's literally forced animals out of a certain area. This is the case in Africa, where the disease-carrying tsetse fly has killed off many species of grazing herbivore in specific regions, to the point where these herbivores' natural habitat range barely overlaps, if at all, with the range of the tsetse fly. A similar situation also exists in the Hawaiian Islands, where some birds live at higher altitudes than the mosquitoes, because the mosquitoes carry a strain of avian influenza. The birds simply can't stand to share a habitat with the mosquitoes, because it's so deadly for them. So this ecological relationship has literally forced the birds to adapt to a habitat at a higher latitude, at a lower oxygen concentration, and with a thinner layer of vegetation, and everything that life entails at a higher altitude. And all of this is just to get away from the bird flu. All of these things that I've mentioned today are all examples of ecological relationships, of biotic and abiotic factors influencing the geographic ranges, the behaviors, the diets, the reproduction, and the lifestyles of all of the organisms that live on this little blue planet. Alright, I think that about covers most of the, the overall picture of ecology. Before I end this episode, I want to briefly talk about a few cool ecological facts and tidbits. Earlier in the episode, I talked about the biosphere, which is the thin sphere of habitable space on the Earth's crust and in its oceans. As I was doing the research for this episode, I wanted to know, how thick or thin is this biosphere? At what altitude can no life naturally exist? At what depth in the soil does it become too hot and the pressure too great for life? Plants and animals exist in a pretty thin biosphere. First of all, they're limited to the ground, 
to the surface of the planet. Some birds and mammals can fly higher than the surface, obviously, but they can't always live in the sky. They have to land to sleep or make nests and nurture their young. The highest point on the terrestrial surface is Mount Everest, which is about 8,850 meters tall at its peak. But no life, except perhaps bacteria, lives natively in the highest regions. Have you ever looked at a mountain or a big hill and noticed that the trees stop at some point up the slopes? There are trees on the base of the mountain, trees on the lower and middle of the slope, but at some height, they just stop, and this forms a line or a wall of trees. This tree line can vary between 3,000 to 8,000 meters in altitude, depending on the region. And beyond that, beyond the tree line, there lives not much more than grasses and shrubs and other simple, small plants, as well as goats and other various mountain-dwelling creatures. But higher than this, Complex life begins to taper off pretty quickly. It's just too cold. There isn't enough rain or nutrients in the soil, if there's even soil at all. Most of the time, when you're on these high-altitude mountain slopes, there's a very thin layer of soil, or maybe just a thin layer of pebbles and rock dust, before you come to bedrock. Even on the only habitable planet that we know of in the universe, too great an altitude brings you right back into inhospitable territory where there's virtually no life. So that's mountains and the land, but what about the oceans? How deep past sea level can complex life exist? Well, complex life like crabs, prawns, and marine plants can exist on most of the seafloor. Well, I mean, marine plants can only exist on the seafloor that's relatively shallow where uh, light can still penetrate deep enough through the water to fuel their photosynthesis. But recent discoveries have shown that complex life can exist at extreme depths, like in the Mariana Trench, which is almost 11,000 meters below sea level. Microbes are now known to thrive in the Mariana Trench, which really isn't that surprising because microbes and other such single-celled organisms, called extremophiles, have been discovered virtually everywhere from deep-sea hydrothermal vents, to deep within the ice sheets of Antarctica, to salty geothermal hot springs. Numerous studies have shown microbial life to exist and to thrive more than a kilometer underground. Microbes have even been found inside cores drilled out from miles within the crust. Experiments in Sweden have demonstrated microbes growing plentifully in rock that's more than five kilometers deep. Or, for those of you who don't use metric, this is around 16,000 feet. Some microbes have even been found in rocks as deep as 19 kilometers, or 12 miles underground. In the deepest parts of caves and mines, and in the deeper parts of the crust, the temperatures get really high as the heat from the Earth's core and its mantle seeps upward to the surface. This internal heat feeds what is called the deep biosphere, which is a subterranean biosphere that covers a greater volume than all other biospheres. This deep biosphere represents nearly 5 times 10 to the power of 17 grams worth of organic carbon, which is apparently close to the mass of the islands of the United Kingdom. And that's all composed of microbes that live in the soil and the bedrock that makes up the upper layers of the Earth's crust. These microbial communities extend for kilometers into the ground beneath our feet, and for kilometers into the mud at the bottom of the ocean. The deep biosphere earns its name because it's quite literally a biosphere of the deep, in the deep, dark, inaccessible parts of the world. All right, I think that's about it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something cool about ecology. I hope you appreciate how interesting and fascinating and complicated ecology is. I feel like when you learn about ecological principles and ecological mechanisms, it almost changes the way you see the world. You begin to notice and pick up on all of these ways that energy and resources are distributed through space and cycled through time. 
If you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button. And if you're excited to hear the rest of this series, then subscribe to my channel so you can get all of those new episodes right when I release them. And as always, thanks for listening.